Anji Lukeji and Amaji, welcome. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, Lukeji, just try. I thought there was an echo. Just say a few, word, few words. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Is it audible? And Amar Bhai, or you also? Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, it's audible. Good afternoon, friends. Uh, I, on behalf of Beyond Law CLC, welcome you all to uh, another uh, attempt on behalf of Beyond Law CLC to give insights to you through eminent speakers on different perspective of law and beyond law itself. And today, amongst us, we have Mr. Amar Vivek, advocate, who has been a former additional advocate general Haryana, and he has more than 30 years of practice. He has different subjects of vast knowledge. That is needless to say that civil law is a forte of both the lawyers. And that is why they can give the insights. And that is why we had requested to give the insights on the subjects of the present topic that is second civil appeals. The topic has been kept as second civil appeals because invariably in different high courts, it is known as second civil appeals, whereas in Punjab and High Court, where both of them are practicing, it is known as regular second appeal. The facets as to what would be the scope of interference in terms of substantial question of law and reappreciation of evidence is a mind which, which invariably comes in the mind of a lawyer as to how and what is invariably the scope of interference. And therefore, we had requested, along with Mr. Amavik, Lokesh Singhal, who, is, who has also been a additional advocate general, but presently he is senior additional advocate general. As we all know that senior additional advocate generals are lawyers who have been engaged by the state for giving insights and for, in fact, for the additional AG as well as senior additional AGs, the qualifications are as good as a judge. Uh, this has not been decided in one case, but in large number of cases. The states, having been appointed them as additional advocate general and senior additional advocate general, itself speaks the volume. And it also gives the fact which we invariably make this information to the lawyers that we bring speakers with immense knowledge and these facts that they will be additional advocate general and senior additional only buttresses are fact that if the state feels that they can be defended properly while they are defending them. So we feel that when they are on the platform, we will have the insights much to the taste of the participants. Mr. Lokesh Singhal has also been a former secretary of the Punjab and Hirana High Court Bar Association, as well as a member of the bar, member bar council. He has also represented not only boards and corporations, but he also has immense knowledge and insights being given in different spectrum of law, civil law, land revenue law, land acquisition and constitution. But again, as I said, the common point between both the uh, keynote speakers is number one, that they have, they are astute lawyers having good knowledge on the civil side. And secondly, they are good orators and can give good insights. Before I formally request Mr. Amar Vivek to give insights, amongst us, I've just noticed that Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Kuldeep Singh has just joined us. He's a former judge of Punjab Haryana High Court. Welcome, sir, and welcome to all the participants who are watching us on the platform, as well as those who have connected us live on the Facebook. Uh, sir, before we request to them, Few word of thoughts about your uh, about this topic of second appeal by Justice Kuldeep Singh, sir. Uh, uh, sir, we have unmuted you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. I come from the services. So what I have noticed that the regular second appeal is virtually the final appeal where the 
high, high court applies the mind to the facts of the case. What I have seen is that the first, the civil case is tried by a civil judge who is comparatively very junior and doesn't uh, have some, uh, say, reservation, some handicaps in deciding the cases. So there is a possibility that there is a wrong decision or wrong appreciation of facts. Unluckily, when the party goes to first appeal, the additional district judge who is either from the services or from the bar, I have noticed that there is a growing tendency to pass a safe order that it dismiss the appeal without applying the mind. So most of the appeals I have seen uh, with my colleagues also when I was additional district judge or district judge that most of them will dismiss the, simply dismiss the appeal. Whereas when I will appreciate it in majority of the cases, the judgment of the lower court is reversed. So here comes the role of the high court. So if the court applies the strict rules that only on the question of law, the appeal will be entertained or substantial question of law, there, can, there may be miscarriage of justice. The duty of the high court is to completely scrutinize each and every case. And if there are some, there is a case which requires reappreciation, the high court should not hesitate exercising its inherent powers. There are, uh, in view of the case law, there are certain handicaps, but there is always a scope for interference when there is a grave miscarriage of justice. As my career in the lower judiciary, district judiciary and in the high court, I have noticed that in many cases, the facts are either not properly appreciated or there is a tendency to pass the safe order that is dismissing the appeal. So I feel that the high court in appropriate cases should be liberal in interfering in the second appeal if the facts of the case so warrant. This is in addition to the point of law which is required to be settled in an appropriate case. Thank you. Thank you, that's all. Uh, so th this is one of the challenge which any lawyer who is in the high court as to, as to whether there has been a proper appreciation of the facts as well as the evidence which has been laid on the file is a challenge and what is the scope of inference becomes paramount. And that is in that process of endeavor, we requested Mr. Amar Vivek and Mr. Lokesh Singhal to connect with us. Mr. Amar Vivek, whether you have joined back, I just learned that there was a power failure. Lokesh? I'm there. Okay, okay. Uh, right. And uh, it's back. It only shows that both of our friends can be down, but they can never be out. That is their spirit, which we have learned not only in, during the law, outside the courtrooms. And the most fascinating factor of both of them is that even outside the courtroom and inside the courtroom, they are a wanting and always are a assisting young lawyer if they want the insights. And that's why when Mr. Amavik said that there's some power failure, I said that there cannot be power failure once you are there because you are a powerhouse, you have been a good blood donor and you have been honored by the government. Over to you, Mr. Vivek, uh, friends, uh, the course of the discussion would be that Mr. Amavik would be discussing on the perspectives as to what are the substantial questions of law in terms of invariably section 100. And Mr. Lokesh would be giving us the insights as to what would be the manner and scope of reappreciation of evidence. And once both of them give their insights, we would be having question and answer session. The questions can be posted in invariably in and around five o'clock. We would be posting also on the chat box. Those who want to post the questions, they can post it on the chat box or on the Facebook who are watching us. Over to Mr. Vivek, as well as thereafter Mr. Lokesh. Thank you to both of you. Yes. Good afternoon, friends. Thank you very much uh, being here on a Sunday afternoon. See, 
the civil trial like the design of an architecture when he designs a building the foundation thereof is most important similarly in a civil trial what is most important is how the trial is conducted how the evidence is adduced of course it starts with pleadings they are most important the evidence the way of leading the evidence and ultimately after the parties have done their bit it the onus is on the trial judge how he determines and analyzes the issues and and renders the judgment now in this regard i would be sharing with you few of the uh, thoughts uh, can i share the because uh, uh, i have uh, some ppts okay uh, we will allow the screen share okay yeah. uh, mr vivek that has been allowed all right so in the at the very outset i will take you to what supreme court said about a trial this is 1993 for scc the judges do not do an easy job they repeatedly do what the rest of us seek to avoid that is make decisions judges though are mortals they are called upon to perform a function that is utterly divine in character the trial judge is the kingpin of the hierarchical system of administration of justice he directly comes in con contract uh, with the litigant during the day to day proceedings in the court on him lies the responsibility to build solemn atmosphere in dispensation of justice the personality knowledge judicial restraint capacity to maintain dignity character conduct official as well as personal and integrity are additional aspects which make the functioning of the court successful and acceptable law is a means to an end and justice is that end but in actuality is my screen seen sorry i i thought there was yes all right but in actuality law and justice are distant neighbors sometimes even strange hostiles if law shoots down justice the people shoot down law and lawlessness paralyzes development disrupts order and retards progress why i said this though it is not in the direct context but it is in the context that a second appeal emerges out of trial so how the trial has taken place will ultimately take us further we cannot expect that if in the trial there are errors or omissions or deficiencies then these can be rectified in the appellate stage or in the second appellate stage of course first appeal is the last court of fact but in second appeal time and again what supreme court has said is that in view of the provisions of section 100 of cpc the scope of interference at the second appeal stage is very narrow and let's see what the supreme court has said right one after the other judgments have come this karnataka board's judgment it was held that the findings of fact could not have been interfered within the second appeal this court held as under this court had repeatedly held that the power of high court to interfere in second appeal under section 100 cpc limited solely to decide a substantial question of law if at all same arises in the case it has deprecated the practice of the high court so then ramanuja's case i have come across more than 50 judgments where supreme court has repeatedly said that interference in the second appellate stage is on a very narrow contour 
of the substantial question of law. So uh, th thereafter in Damodar Lal, again in 2016, Supreme Court explained that perversity was uh, not by itself a ground for the interference. And Supreme Court said, perversity has been the subject matter of umpteen number of decisions of this court. It has also been laid down in several decisions of the court that first appellate court under section 96 of the CPC is the last court of facts unless the findings are based on evidence or are perverse. Then same thing is repeated in Santosh Hajari's case again a path breaker that was in 2001. Gurdev Kaur is a much reported judgment. Recently also in uh, a municipal committee Hucharpur's case, it was uh, held on the same lines. And uh, one, once I was going through the judgments, the latest judgment I found was uh, in February 20, where the High Court said, uh, the Supreme Court said, maybe the High Court could have taken a different view if it was acting as a trial court. But once the two courts have returned a finding, which is not based upon any misreading of material documents, nor is recorded against any provisions of law. Neither it can be said that any judge acting uh, judicially and reasonably could not have reached such a finding. Then the High Court cannot be said to have erred. Result resultantly, no substantial question of law arose for the consideration before the High Court. So as we know, substantial question of law would be the reason for the High Court to interfere in the second appeal stage. Therefore, it is extremely important that the trial takes place in a proper manner in accordance with law and a lawyer's duty is well executed only when he is able to discharge the onus placed upon him by his client. Now coming to the subject, how it proceeds, we all know that in section 96, where the first appeal comes, then certain amendments came uh, in section 100 and I'm reading section 100 as it stands now. Save as otherwise expressly provided in the body of this code or by any other code for the time being in force an appeal shall lie to the high court from every decree passed in appeal by any court subordinate to the high court if the high court is satisfied that the case involves a substantial question of law. Therefore, the, again in uh, sub clause 4 it says where the High Court is satisfied that a substantial question of law is involved in the case, it shall formulate that question. And sub clause 3 also said this, in an appeal under this section, the memorandum of appeal shall precisely state substantial question of law involved in the appeal. And then coming to 5, the appeal shall be heard on the question so formulated and the respondent at the hearing of the appeal be allowed to argue that it does not involve that question, provided that nothing in this subsection shall be deemed to take away or abridge power of the court to hear for reasons to be recorded the appeal on any other substantial question of law not formulated. The reason for these amendments or these widespread uh, insertions or reliance on substantial question of law was, as we know that the CPC is of 1908. It has stood the test of time, but it had somehow slowed the pace of the trials and thereafter the matters had started clogging in, in the higher courts. Now, thereafter, the legislature in its wisdom decided to restrict the scope of interference by the higher courts. Therefore, Section 100 relies mainly on these substantial questions of law. Now, it is the common practice when we as a lawyer present any appeal, second appeal before the High Court. The moment appeal is heard, the Honorable Judge would ask us immediately to read that portion of the finding or observations of the usually first appellate court against which we have filed the appeal. So obviously, we would be asked to read those observations, findings from the judgment of the appellate court. And by the time the reading is done, half of the mind of the bench would already be 
in tune with the findings given by the appellate court because at that time we must be aware that the honorable bench has gone through the judgments of the courts below therefore as lawyers it is incumbent upon us because we have only been given the right to draft the grounds and narrate the questions there in this manner if we do not seize the opportunity well in time at the time of drafting that we are able to catch the attention of the bench by way of striking aspects of the matter wherein we can dislodge the judgment of the courts below especially the appellate court and the trial court which are under challenge we will not be able to gain the attention of the honorable high courts interference so we will have to be street smart as well otherwise reading the findings of the courts below we will not be able to persuade the bench to take a different so recently rather i would uh, uh, refer the judgment of uh, justice rena though it is rendered in a service matter case uh, how the rss pertaining to service matters would be entertained but i would say that we should take cue from the observations of the court that the lawyers should also present the synopsis they should also present the compendium of facts date even charts they should also present the summary of rules regulations if any involved in the matter and place on record importantly and place on record the relevant pieces of evidence statements documents etc along with the appeal before appeal is entertained now if we don't do that we cannot expect that the honorable court would allow us to place them on record at a later stage or would uh, the honorable court would be summoning the records later on to peruse all this like in supreme court we present the complete paper book similarly in the second appellate stage itself where the scope of interference is very very narrow and limited we carry that onus with us and we need to be uh, you know that well prepared that we place on record the relevant material before the court so that the court is able to infer that there is a palpable error there is a substantial question of law involved in the matter and therefore the interference should be taken by us through our efforts from the honorable court now in the light of this i am trying to represent before you that considering that the scope is very narrow we will have to pin down the attention of the honorable court to those aspects those crucial aspects or substantial aspects on the basis of which we feel that we can be able to get the attention of the court as it is said that in the second appeal stage the court has a birds eye view of the matter so when the court has a birds eye view the court should be able to infer the illegality to see the illegality without much effort if we are asking the court to run through the volume of pages and reams of the papers we will not be able to get relief for our client so this is where our labor our effort and i would say an extra mile travel on our part is involved now coming back to the some bare provisions and then i take you to the next aspect section 102 of course restricted the uh, entertainment of second appeal for a subject matter for which the value was only exceeding rupees 25000 below 25000 rupees there is no second appeal now after the 99 amendments 
of course section 103 is another aspect but uh, my brother lokesh will be dealing with it therefore i am omitting to uh, mention it right now now you see once i spoke to you about the basics of the appeal i should also be able to tell you about the procedure involved in the appeals and how we can improve ourselves or improve our presence and uh, improve our presentation before the honorable court so the analysis here was second appeal is to a high court it is within 90 days from the date of the decree we can appeal against the expiry decree and then no second appeal for value of less than 25000 rupees and second appeal is only on the grounds mentioned in sections 100 that is substantial questions of law now when we say grounds of appeal again as i said that it is onus is on us to draft grounds in a very crisp and clear manner where the high court is satisfied that the case involves substantial question of law and substantial question of law should be stated in our memorandum of appeal and the high court on our presentation will frame that question will formulate that question this is what was laid down in kulwant court's judgment of 2001 and the appeal shall be heard only on that question or any other substantial question which is the inherent power of the high court now again this is 103 so i will omit this now coming to the procedure of order 43 order 41 as we know it comprises of a memorandum or grounds then copy of the judgment and decree we can take additional grounds with the leave of the court under order 41 rule 2 in the event of money decree we have to obtain stay only if we are able to deposit the amount or we are able to furnish the security thereof then there is a summary power for the high court to reject the appeal or return the appeal now coming to the condonation of delay because this is one aspect which is mostly not uh, you know given much importance by us if there is a delay so the delay will entail the filing of an application for condonation of delay plus an affidavit which shall give reasons for delay and the sufficient cause inherent there now i want to read this clause order 41 rule 3a on the condonation of delay it says when an appeal is presented after the expiry of period of limitation specified therefore it shall be accompanied by an application supported by affidavit setting forth the facts on which the appellant relies to satisfy the court that he had sufficient cause for not preferring the appeal within such period if the court sees no reason to reject the application without the issue of notice to the respondent notice thereof shall be issued to the respondent and matter shall be finally decided by the court before it proceeds to deal with the appeal under rule 11 or rule 13 as the case may be kindly mark this rule 11 and rule 13 i need to advert to these rules little later where an application has been made under sub rule 1 the court shall not make an order for the stay of the execution of the decree against which the appeal is proposed to be filed so long as the court does not after hearing the rule 11 decide to hear the appeal now this is a very very tricky situation if there is a delay in the filing of the appeal and we have filed an application for condonation of delay the court would be not granting us the stay in view of a bar contained in order 41 rule 3a so till the delay is condoned or till the application is disposed of seeking condonation of delay under rule 11 so many courts we have seen they have been declining to grant a stay till the application for condonation of delay is disposed of now coming to the stay part 
order 41 rule 5 appeal is not an automatic stay of the impugned decree and stay is effected from the date of communication then there has to be an affidavit by the appellant there is a power for the court which made the judgment whose judgment is under challenge to grant us the stay by itself till we get the appeal heard and the application should be presented without unreasonable delay and we should be able to point out substantial loss prima facie case and there can be also security for performance of the decree or the order so these are the amendments which were brought after the 99 amendments where the insertions were made but these have been well explained in Salem Bar's case so it need not, need not to detain us any further on this now I take you to rule 11 of order 41 you see it said that appeal can be dismissed in a summary manner the court will record of course reasons now it says appeal should be heard within 60 days under rule 11. It means what? It means that where we have filed an application for condemnation of delay, along with an application for stay of the impugned decree, then the court and then the court under rule 11 says that this must be disposed of in 60 days. Idea is that if we are able to get the application for condemnation of delay, disposed of in 60 days time, then we will be able to press for the state. In reality, we know that this does not happen. It is difficult for us to get the appeal listed, heard, notice issued, reply received, and then heard within 60 days. So that does not mean that this is a rule because the word shell has been used there. But this has been interpreted. They say that idea is not to frustrate the right to appeal. Idea is not to deny the hearing of the appeal. Idea is not to deny the substantive right. If the court finds prima facie reason to interfere and there is a delay application and there is also a stay application, the court will apply its mind and then court can even direct the execution to be stayed and so there are various judgments now on this issue which have come and they have explained this issue very well. So then again procedure for admission has come, uh, right to begin dismissal on non-appearance of appellant, restoration. Another aspect which is very important for our knowledge is cross objections. Mr. Vivek, you could just stop the annotation part because someone is scribbling. Though I would request the participants not to scribble on the screen. The intent is to disseminate knowledge and uh, no useful purpose would be achieved by scribbling on the uh, screen sharing what Mr. Vivek is doing. I thought that somebody was painting colors. <laughs> oh, painting colors is there, but the uh, paint and the brush as well as the colors have to be in the right perspective so that it comes better. All right. Thank you. So, in the cross objections part, you see, many a times there have to be cross appeals. Now, one needs not to file an appeal if against that very decree, already the other party has filed an appeal. We could go in for cross objections. Uh, Mr. Vikas, I will just take a minute's time uh, and I will digress. I am seeing in this meeting the presence of Honorable Justice Kuldeep Singh and uh, he has been a great teacher, he has been a great judge and I really feel honored and humbled to see my lord here. Uh, we have been learning a lot from my lord and uh, we really welcome him in the uh, our meeting and it is a great honor for us to have his lordship's presence with us. We are indeed honored sir. Thank you. Much obliged. So the cross objections have to be filed under Rule 22. These are within 30 days. And uh, 
30 days again has been explained 30 days of the service of notice to the other party by the court notice of the final hearing so it is like a counter appeal it has to have the court fees and even if the appeal is withdrawn the cross objections will be heard then we come on the powers of the appellate court powers of the appellate court are remand under rule 23 or 23a or to frame the issues and refer them back for the trial of course final determination or take the additional evidence and additional evidence is founded on the principles enunciated in the rule 27 where the court below has either refused to admit the evidence or which after the due diligence evidence was not within the knowledge or could not have been produced court requires such evidence there is a sufficient cause so that is how under order 41 uh, rule 27 we can have the additional evidence and then the idea is the power of the court under rule 23 is to do full and complete justice between the parties section 109 is uh, appeal to supreme court that is also important because although it is not uh, usually invoked after slp practice has come in vogue hardly any certificate matter is issued under 109 to appeal to the supreme court so knowing full well that as a lawyer when the appeal has to be filed the second appeal the scope of interference thereof is so limited it is on such narrow compass as a lawyer it is a duty to present the matter in such crisp nice and concise manner that we are able to raise the substantial question of law which is not an ordinary question which is of substantial nature on which the court will be compelled to exercise its power of interference and the court will ultimately interfere. So if we are able to present those matters within the compass of section 100, there is no reason that why cannot we get the relief from the court in the regular second appeal or in the second civil appeal. But then it's a matter of practice. It's a matter of more and more imbibing of knowledge. It is a matter wherein the work, real work starts. See, the trial may take sufficiently long time. First appeal may take another, you know, good number of years. But when we file the regular second appeal or the second civil appeal before the high court, we have to bear it in mind that to get the attention of the court on a substantial question we may not be able to spend even more than a minute's time of the honorable court if we have crystal clear point called out in front of us on the basis of which we can obtain the interference of a court i will just give you a, a very brief illustration once i filed a second appeal in my good old days, it happened to be listed before Justice Jawaharlal Gupta. Justice Jawaharlal Gupta was, uh, you know, endowed with such bliss that he would read our brief from front to back and back to front. And before we had even stood, at, stood up and articulated the point, he would shoot us with questions, which we will find it, you know, so hard to answer. So, in that matter, there was an issue of consideration. Now, a very big business house had, had during those days in, uh, I would say, 80s, had given, uh, you know, a projection that an amount of uh, rupees 2 crores was given as a gift by a person to an unknown person. Both the courts were below, uh, courts below were against me. And I was arguing that this consideration is not a valid consideration because it could not be believed that a person will part with such a huge amount without any uh, link or knowledge or, uh, 
you know kind of connection so the moment i got up my lord in his usual style he would uh, you know look at you with dagger's look and uh, he asked me he said there is nothing in this matter i said yes my lord there is a consideration the consideration is how could one give consideration to a person who is totally unknown an amount of 2 crores is not an ordinary amount and therefore the honorable court will find it as a substantial reason to interfere in second appeal because if i can show to your lordship that the person had no connection the beneficiary who got the amount had no connection this consideration would not be a valid consideration and immediately my lord threw the file and said yes you have made a point so what i want to tell all my esteemed colleagues much of many of you are equally or more experienced than what we are that the entire labor the entire effort the onus is on us if we can bring it bring the subject matter of second appeal within the within the contours of section 100 draft it carefully present the material relevant along with the appeal we will be able to get the relief from the court so rest my friend mr lokesh sinhal is there he will take you on the appreciation part thank you very much for giving me this opportunity i am much obliged thank you mr vivek my elder brother and my dear friend he has explained the scope of section 100 very elaborately and has left a little very little scope for me but still i'll try my best to to the best of my ability now before coming to the issue as to where the high court in the exercise of jurisdiction under section 100 can interfere even if there is no substantial question of law i would just give the background of uh, section 41 punjab courts act because the lawyers practicing here in the punjab haryana high court are governed by the section 41 only now section 41 of the punjab court act this punjab court act is of 1918 and code of civil procedure was enacted in 1908 so initially section 100 of unamended section 100 of uh, cpc and section 41 of the punjab court act were almost peri materia there was no difference Uh, mr vikas if you can please allow me to share the screen uh, lokesh that par is already with you all right ye ho nahi raha mata ha yes it has started yes so if you can see now the section 41 and the unamended section 100 cpc the wordings are almost the same only difference is that in clause a and b along with uses word custom has also been added now since 19 118 till 1978 this issue therefore never crop up as to which of the provision will prevail because the provisions were peri materia okay bhai well, that screen sharing has been allowed uh, you have started but uh, nothing is forthcoming on the screen just a yes but slightly Not, bigger uh, make the font uh, slightly bigger okay now it is fine slightly more
yes not perfect okay so because the both these provisions for peri materia this issue never cropped up now after this section 100 was amended wide amendment act 1976 this issue came up before the full bench of this court punjab and haryana high court as to which of the provision will prevail the full bench after referring to section 4 subsection 1 cpc and the wordings of section 100 itself uh, first line of the section 100 itself came to the conclusion that it will be section 41 being a special law which will prevail over section 100 the position continued till 1988 1998 1998 even the honorable supreme court also in the case of 1998 volume 2 supreme court cases page 81 lokesh bhai if you could stop the annotation because certain participants feel that uh, these slides are for the purposes of their creative mind of doing paintings and these things these lockdowns do help us to unlock our minds for different perspective but i think they can use a better canvas for better paintings <laughs> all right yes so no screen sharing can be done but you can stop there's a feature of uh, stop annotations automatically that creativity will stop let me try if i can do it so otherwise even if they try to scribble they can they say that even the best of the uh, river waters cannot stop the uh, rocks to stay on their uh, river course itself we will still understand the insights what you are giving but i will request the participants not to scribble uh, we can sh uh, they can send us the text we can send them the uh, canvases for the painting part yes lokesh so 90 in 1998 volume 2 supreme court cases page 81 this issue came up before the honorable supreme court and honorable supreme court affirmed the view of our full bench Uh, however later on in 2001 volume 4 supreme court cases page 262 that is kulwant scorts case this issue again cropped up and it was argued that so far as 1998 volume 2 scc page 81 is concerned since it was on the basis of concession so it will not be a binding precedent and the court is required to go on to this question again as to whether it is the section 41 which will prevail over section 100 or the section 100 itself the supreme court after referring to section 97 sub section 1 of the amendment act 1976 and also after referring to article 254 of the constitution of india held that since it is a central law section 100 of cpc will prevail over the state law which is the punjab court act thereafter as everyone know practicing here in the court we started filing appeal under section 100 we will we would formulate substantial questions of law in our memorandum of appeal and only the appeal would be entertained now again in 2016 volume 6 supreme court cases an issue arose before the honorable supreme court which was pertaining to the uh, kochi uh, high court kerala high court wherein the provision of travancore high court visa with the provisions of the cpc came up before the honorable supreme court as to which of the provision would prevail in that case the reliance was placed upon this kulwant court case and since it was the constitution bench which was hearing the matter constitution bench held that the decision given in kulwant court's case is not a correct law the super, uh, constitution bench held that so far as the reliance of the super, uh, bench in 1990 in 2001 kulwant court's case upon section 971 of the amendment act is concerned the same would not be applicable as it would be applicable only where some amendment has been brought in the schedule 1 by the high court and the constitution bench further held that article 254 would also not be applicable in this case because 19 uh, punjab courts act being pre constitutional law is saved by article 372 of the constitution 
Now, thereafter, we have now again started filing the appeal under section 41. There is no requirement of framing any substantial question of law. Now, very importantly, in Kulwant Kaur's case, the Honorable Supreme Court also held that it is the Uh, Lukesh, uh, you can uh, do the screen sharing that power is with you. Yes, yes. Different. Next slide. Yes, section 103 has come. Yes. Next, next slide. Yes. Section 103, which provides that even if the, in any second appeal, the High Court may, if In any second appeal, the High Court may, if the evidence on the record is sufficient, determine any issue necessary for the disposal of the appeal, which has not been determined by the lower appellate court or both by the court of first instance and the lower appellate court, or which has been wrongly determined by such court or courts by reason of a decision on such question of law as is referred to in section 100. Now in Kulwant Kaur's case, the Supreme Court although held that it will be section 100 which would be which would prevail over section 41 but at the same time it was also held that the Technically alone by itself ought not to permit the High Court to decide the issue since justice oriented approach is the call of the day presently. That is, and but the fact remains that scrutiny of evidence will be totally prohibited in the matter of exercise of jurisdiction in second appeal would be too broad a proposition and too rigid an interpretation of law not worthy of acceptance. If the concept of justice so warrants, we do not see any reason why such an exercise would be deprecated. This is, however, without expression of any opinion pertaining to section 100. Now, further it was held that fact remains that while it is true that in a second appeal, a finding of fact, even if erroneous, will generally not be disturbed, but where it is found that the findings stand vitiated on wrong test and on the basis of assumptions and conjectures, and resultantly there is an element of perversity involved therein, the High Court, in our view, will be within its jurisdiction to deal with the issue. And then the reference to Section 103 was made. The only thing which the Supreme Court had said, that needless to say, however, that perversity itself is a substantial question worth adjudication. What is required is, a categorical finding on the part of the High Court as to perversity. So if the High Court records a categoric finding that the judgment of the appellate court or both the courts below are perverse, the High Court would be within its jurisdiction to interfere exercising its, uh, the powers under section 103. Now, similarly, there are judgments like one judgment in 2001, Volume 2000, Volume 1, SCC, page 434, Ishwar Das Jain versus Sohan Lal. In this case, the Honorable Supreme Court has held that where the courts below have considered some evidence which is inadmissible or 
has failed to consider the evidence which was in, in uh, which was admissible then again it would be a case where the high court would interfere in exercise of its jurisdiction under section 100 there was another case of two reported as santosh hajari versus prashottam tiwari 2001 1 volume 3 scc page 173 179 in this case the honorable supreme court said that such question involved in a case held must have foundation in the pleading and should emerge from sustainable findings of fact reached by courts of facts and further an answer to such question must, must be necessary for a just and proper decision of the case however a completely new point raised before high court for the first time held would not be a question involved in the case unless it went to the root of the matter like we know that question of law, limitation of course can be taken even in second appeal because it goes to the root of the case the high court in this case has further held substantial question of law whether a question is or not depends on facts and circumstances of each case essential overall consideration is the need to strike a judicious balance between the duty to do justice at every stage and the pressing necessity of preventing delay in the final disposal of a case so it is the justice oriented approach which the high court should take and if judicious balance between the duty to do justice at every stage is also to be taken into consideration now there is another case reported as 2001 volume 4 scc 694 saraswati versus s ganpati in this case the honorable supreme court said that where the finding of the court below even though it is a finding of fact but is it is contrary to the evidence available on record the high court would be well within its jurisdiction under section 100 to interfere and set aside those findings so the purpose of quoting all these judgments was that no doubt section 100 provides that the high court would entertain appeal only in the case of substantial question of law but at the same time perversity also amounts the to substantial question of law reading something in evidence which is inadmissible is also a substantial question of law findings of fact recorded contrary to the evidence available on record is again a substantial question of law so therefore taking help from section 103 i would submit that we can very well satisfy the court that there is a case where if the evidence has not been taken into consideration or has been misread then of course it amounts to a substantial question of law i think i have covered whatever little mr marvik has left for me so the insights uh given by mr amar vek and mr lokesh singhal have been well taken if someone has a question on that particular aspect on both the topics which my both the learned friends and my brothers have covered mr amar vek uh, the same can be posted and one of the participant has requested for the citations both of you can share with me so okay. we can share it with the whatsapp group Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, two of the participants have raised the hands. We are unmuting them. They can ask their questions directly. You have done in such a lucid manner that nobody has posted the question. This is a one of the first webinar where none of the question has come forth. Maybe otherwise also study. <laughs> <laughs> So since the questions have not come uh, and we will also unmute justice kuldeep singh we can that citation part uh, mr savitri 
both the participants, uh, both the speakers have consented. Since we have also unmuted uh, Justice uh, Kuldeep Singh, uh, we can take it one is now is by Abhi uh, that there was a judgment by the Supreme Court that framing of substantial question of law is not mandatory in Punjab. That is what is your take? Only which I have referred to Pankashi, wherein the earlier judgment in Kulwan's course was overruled okay. and it was held that section 41 would prevail over section 100. It was in 2016, not 2019. Yes. This is by Bhaskar Jha. Uh, this is not on the chat box. But he's, uh, Bhaskar Jha asks how the second it should have been appealed, but he writes, speak, always lie with the High Court. You see, the power of the first appeal um, in the matter of trials is with the district courts. Unlike a uh, few cases which uh, where the High Court in you know, its original jurisdiction has entertain the trial in Delhi High Court or in the High Courts of Judicature, where the original jurisdiction is there. So trial is with the trial court. First appeal is again by the district judge. Second appeal is always by the High Court, because this is the power vested in the High Court to entertain the second appeal. That is how the scheme of the code has been enacted. Therefore, power of the second appeal is only with the High Court. Uh Since we have uh, Justice Kuldeep Singh amongst yes, us, he was always known for writing judgments in a short and crisp manner, whatever is the volume. So I will be putting a question since, uh, in case any questions asked. Let's assume that somebody gets an appeal to be filed for the Honorable High Court. So what would be the best way to formulate the uh, pleadings or to the judgments to give have a have a bird eye view so that one can give an insight to a client that what is the scope of his interfer uh, scope of interference in the appeal which he's likely to file. First, I will ask Justice Kuldeep Singh, or it can be other way around so that he can. They say the lawyers will make the submissions, and we will ask Justice Kuldeep Singh to make the conclusions. Let's assume Kuldeep a client Kuldeep comes. Will like to hear from his lordship. Uh, no, I will say, uh, sir, would we will ask sir to make a ultimate analysis because. Uh, uh, we are fort fortunate enough that he has joined with us. So let's have the intakes one. Uh, let's assume a client comes to Mr. Amavek and he says that these, this is my file. And we have a very few time, time lag with, with that also to explain to the client what is the scope. So what is the take for a young lawyer to do, whether he should go through the pleadings first or through the judgments to see and apprise the client what is the scope? You see, Vikas, it has been my practice in all civil matters, that first of all, I draw a chronology for myself. I draw a chronology of facts, documents, exhibits, because a client would uh, narrate to me a cause in his own manner. But the way the trial has proceeded, sometimes the trial may have 400, 500 documents. And each document has its own nuances, its own beauties, its own interpretation. And there is a possibility that something has been missed out, which the client wanted uh, the courts below to look at. So unless you are in the driver's seat of a matter, you will not be able to give a mind uh, uh, to the client because getting the hang of the matter is one thing, but getting at the heart of the matter is the most crucial aspect. So a lawyer in second appeal cannot commit a mistake of giving a summary, you know, conclusion to a client. But yes, to some clients, I have given summary conclusion. I can tell you, uh, recently, I got a client who was referred to me by uh, one of my relations. He came to me, presented a big volume of papers to me and asked me that, sir, I have to file a second appeal. So I was very, very tired on that day. Somehow, my steam in the engine was almost at the tag end. So I cursory opened the uh, first appellate court's judgment and I found that the son had filed a case against the father that he should not be evicted from his father's house because he had made some investment and all that and he had contributed and all that and both the courts had decided against the son and the son came to me for filing the second appeal. So the moment I read that passage, I closed the file and returned the brief to him. I said, sorry, 
you are in a wrong place you should be at your father's feet then in the court of law so that is one way uh, that you uh, where you find the matter totally absurd you should not uh, be handling that matter that's a different thing but otherwise the matter requires a very graphic preparation uh, at the stage of second appeal this is how i feel that we should look at it as lawyers thank you so let's have the take of mr lokesh also and we are fortunate enough that one of our speakers mr avnish mithal has also joined us so we'll unmute him so that we have the insights from the persons who have knowledge on the civil side uh, yes lokesh what is your take let's assume what i had posted posted a question to him mr amarvik said first of all if i have to file a second appeal first of i all i will start from the pleadings what is the case in the plaint and what is the defense in the written statement then of course what are the issues framed on the basis of the pleadings and the evidence led and then how the courts have dealt with the evidence and how they have committed an error while on facts in, uh, as so much as pleading or the evidence led by the parties uh, now question which the uh, which mr avnish mittal has uh, asked i have already replied in the chat box also that after this pankaj ashi case in 2016 whereby the earlier kulwant course case has been overruled yes we can file appeals under section 41 and as a matter of fact i have been filing all appeals under section 41 without formulating any question of law and my uh, all the appeals are being entertained and no objection is being raised even by the registry that there is no substantial question of law framed in the me so before we ask justice kuldeep singh since avnish is also there and he is also on the civil side we will also ask his insights let's assume a case comes to him what is his advice to the young lawyer young lawyers or students of law what should be the way forward yes avnish uh vikas ji thank you so much um, and uh, can I, we see your video though your voice is as good as mohammad rafi but still we would <laughs> like to see your video. Uh, uh all right let me just uh, try because i uh, yeah okay yes thank you so much uh, for uh, giving me this honor and i am thankful to my elder brothers vivek ji and uh, uh, lokesh ji for explaining the concept of section 100 in such a beautiful way well uh, my question was very limited to the aspect that since we already had a full bench of ganpat that, that was way back uh, prior to the amendment in section 100 so now uh, that kulwant kaur judgment has been overruled by supreme court in chandrika's case so do we go back to the position what was there prior to the amendment of section 100 though lokesh ji has already answered to uh, this question in the chat box and as well as on the video but i just wanted to be sure because there are uh, certain instances whereby again the supreme court is remanding back there are a lot of uh, second appeals on the questions uh, which are not framed uh, by the high court while deciding the second appeals so this was one of the issues that was uh, causing confusion uh, confusion to uh, all the uh, advocates and on the judicial as well as on the legal side yeah uh, uh, since we Sometimes said that we have yes yes lokesh you could continue in court is hearing the slp so the special law is not pointed out to the bench and the bench because they the supreme court judges might not necessarily be from this court so and this judgment of the constitution bench if not brought to the you know, uh, then maybe you are right that the cases are being remanded back but the position of law as it stands today is that section 41 as interpreted by the full bench in ganpat's case is now a holding good and it will prevail over section 100 cpc so we will ask <laughs> yeah Uh, i'm just asking since we had requested justice uh, kuldeep singh so what is the best way according to you uh, a young lawyer or any lawyer for that matter should start his statement once he knows that he is pitted with two judgments against him or for that matter it's a judgment of reversal what is your advice what he should structure while framing the grounds of appeal and what should be his style to make the opening statement in a courtroom so that the judge feels yes there is some little window Uh, and how he should come from the ventilator to uh, to the rom- normal room uh because uh, i think uh, 
in the high court there it may be so you would have to come slightly closer to the speaker so that the audibility is better okay uh, i think it's okay now yes sir better i think in the high court uh, it may be practically a last chance for the party so the lawyer has to be very vigilant i think as uh, brother lokesh has pointed out i feel that it will be most appropriate for a year first to go through the pleadings of the trial court he should, he should start from the trial court from the pleadings then the documents also these are very important the documents attached with the lower court and the evidence and then see the judgment of the lower court and the first appellate court because many times i have found that the wrong facts are mentioned in the judgment either of the lower court or the first appellate court and on the basis of the wrong facts the wrong decision is given so once you get get the grip over the matter then you are in a position to point out correctly to the court that this is the miscarriage of justice or the substantial question of law or the perversity so what happens that many times the liars they only go through the judgments and from the judgments they try to build up a case which may not convince the judge so if you are on the solid grounds as the brother lokesh has pointed out you are very uh, conversant with the pleadings the documents and the evidence then you can point out the substantial question of law or the misreading of evidence or the perversity of the judgment and i tell you in i have found that in the first appeal it is my practical experience experience that in about uh, 50% cases the judgment of the trial court is found to be perverse and based on the wrong appreciation of evidence or the evidence which doesn't exist or the ignoring of some of the material documents i tell you in some of the cases some of the judges feel that the since there is a presumption of truth attached with the jawabandi so it has to prevail but they forget that this presumption is rebuttable so if there is a sale deed which shows that the uh, the ownership was transferred it has to be taken into consideration and it will prevail over the jama mandi so i think it is the proper for a young lawyer to first have the mastery over the facts that is the pleadings the documents and the evidence before the trial court and then formulate the questions you know the in the courts the judges don't have much time so if you come prepared with the synopsis as uh, uh, brother amar vivek has pointed out it becomes easy for the judge to formulate a question and correctly and appreciate the facts and then pass an appropriate order and it can be a, a good service to set here as the liar gets the justice for his party vikas ji i would just want to supplement what my lord justice uh, kuldeep singh has said first of all my lord it has always been a pleasure appearing before you and arguing any case either it is revision appeal or whatever and just as it has happened with me there was no need to cite any law only on facts if we are set, we could satisfy the court then the my lord would interfere and grant the relief because as it, my lord has just had uh, stated that yes we have to put this facts straight we must the law will follow the facts only now what my lord was just saying about the first appellate court in the case of santosh hajari versus prashottam tiwari which is reported as 2001 three supreme court cases 179 even the supreme court has said that improper functioning of first appellate court may give rise to substantial question of law judgment of first appellate court held must display conscious application of mind and record findings supported by reasons on all issues and contentions where a doubt arises as to whether first appellate court has carried out its functions correctly such doubt itself may give rise to a substantial question of law so this is the correct correct observation as i have said in the beginning that i have seen the working i have the advantage of seeing the working of my uh, brother judges in the lower courts also so i have seen that the most of my brother judges in the lower courts they will simply pass a safe order dismiss the appeal without looking into the merits so there are courts of adjs and district judges where 100% appeals are dismissed there is no exception so they don't properly they don't apply the mind because for a, a judgment worthy judgment you need a 
they study the file thoroughly and pass a reasoned order so they think that the dismissal of will is the safe order so here comes the duty of the high court to scrutinize the facts the pleadings and everything to see that no injustice is done with the party so in most of the question i say the law is settled on almost all the points and if on the facts there is there is a fact on which some uh, law is required to be applied only then the court can see that whether the law is correctly applied or not but in most of the cases there is a misappreciation of facts and there is a perversity in the judgments which need to be interfered uh, this is what i feel thank you sir so mr marappa uh, has raised his hand we are unmuting mr marappa you can ask the question directly if you want a pointed question to particular uh, keynote speaker Mr. Marappa, if you could unmute. Uh, meanwhile, I can ask a question which Nikunj Dhawan, a lawyer at Jabra and I quote himself, says that what is the best way forward to show that on the point of will, how it can be challenged to show that it is a suspicious one? Vivek ji. Uh, so, you see, to negate the testimony of a testator, it is very difficult to say that the testator meant this or that only grounds for interference where gross suspicion or gross uh, you know uh, i would say uh, disbelief of the will is that the testator did not execute the will or he was not in that uh, disposing state of mind sound disposing state of mind as we say that the interference could be called for especially in the high court stage where we are in the second appeal stage to doubt the veracity of a bill we should be able to point out to that striking piece of evidence where we can say that it was impossible for the testator to execute the bill so this is one area or uh, there could be similar striking suspicious circumstances so they are all borne out on the evidence and that is how as my lord has very rightly pointed out uh, honorable justice kudeep singh that scanning of the facts becoming master of the facts of the uh, record of the court below we should be able to point out the glaring illegality so this has to emerge from the record and that is how we will be able to challenge the veracity of so uh, is concerned actually there are two position one is that the will is not uh, uh, will is not proved it is not validly executed but law with regard to will is that even if it is validly uh, executed proved but it is surrounded by uh, suspicious circumstances the court would not believe it even if it's, if it's due execution is proved so that suspicious circumstances is altogether a different thing law on bill if somebody wants to read then my lord justice rajmohan singh's latest judgment in the case of raja farid courts it's a wonderful judgment on bill the whole law right from the beginning till today has been considered and discussed uh in a lighter vein they they say that where there is a will there is also a will <laughs> meanwhile uh we have a question posed by prasad he says can the issues can we change the issues in second appeal or not we will ask justice kuldeep singh for his insights and then we will uh, he uh, his question is can we change the issues in the uh, second appeal that is Uh, in an RSA, or we call, or the regular second appeal, or second civil appeals, as as is known in some other high courts. Normally, the in the second appeal, the high court doesn't interfere in the issues. But if there is an issue which goes to the root of the case, and it has not been framed, the high court can always, I think, uh, they can interfere and uh, frame the issue. But it is very rare. 
not a, it is a, not a routine it is very rare that it is done so that if we, that issue is framed and it is found that the evidence on that issue has already been led the court can consider it if not led then of course it is uh, very tricky to remand the case because you know uh, i am always against remanding the cases because it amount to getting rid of the case and throwing it to somebody else so court are very slow in framing the issues in the second appeal only in very rare cases where it goes to root of the case it has caused injustice grave injustice to the parties only then the uh, court can interfere and uh, frame some additional issue so uh, this any of you could uh, answer this is by on the facebook kunti madi lakshminachar whether date of filing of suit and date of pronouncement of the judgment decides the forum or not sorry what is the question sir so question is whether date of filing of the suit or the date of pronouncement of the judgment decides the forum date of filing the suit date of filing the suit because uh, uh, th there is a possibility that during the interregnum the jurisdictions have changed so it is the date of filing of the suit which will determine the forum uh, this is a question which invariably will not arise out here uh if you can give insights he say uh, the question from bhaskar jha bhaskar kumar jha is if the high court tries the case in its original jurisdiction then how second appeal would lie with the high court because in certain courts as we all know it's a court of original jurisdiction where they there take is the no case. second appeal if uh, if the uh, and lp would lie lp would lie where, where the high court is exercising its original jurisdiction and judgment is by the single judge and lp would lie lp would lie but uh, otherwise uh, there is no second appeal uh, the original jurisdiction means uh, the high court judge has tried the matter then the lp only would lie nothing else there is no second appeal uh, i think the questions which have been posted not only on the group as well as the facebook they have been taken and it was an insightful session <clears throat> before we apart for the day as we all know that beyond law clc is with a continuous endeavor with the webinars tomorrow we have amongst us mr gautam joshi a senior advocate from gujarat he would be giving his insights on constitutional safeguard its overview dismissal removal or reduction and its discharge what are the challenges and what are the safeguards protected to a public servant his insights so do stay connected with us tomorrow again at 4 pm and thank you to justice kuldeep singh words fall short it only shows the humility on his part that he has joined with us and given his insights and i am quite sacrosanct to the effect at least i am uh, to the effect that the insights given by him on the topic of the cuff shows the volume of knowledge he has uh, we are thankful on behalf of beyond law clc and to, so much so i can also take this much leverage because they are my brothers uh, mr amar vivek and mr lokesh singhal would also share this common opinion it's a rare platform that the lawyers commonly agree on a common platform to the effect that we have all been enriched by his knowledge uh, thank you mr amar vivek for the insightful session and and same with mr lokesh singhal we have all been uh, enlightened by the i would say legal discourse from both of you as well as justice kuldeep singh and the short shot by the avnish mithal was again an insightful insights showing that the volume of knowledge he also have and thank you to all the participants not only on those who have connected us on this platform but all those who have connected with us on live on the facebook uh mr singhal and mr amavek your uh, mr sinhal whatever takes you would like to give a young a tip to the young lawyers and students of law what is your take before we part for the day all right i'll <laughs> pick up the thread see i would say a lawyer always remains young and he always remains a student so to say that what i do not know of law is not worth knowing at all it does not arise here i rather say that a lawyer needs to have four hours in his life 
फर्स्ट इज अ रीडिंग रीडिंग वन जजमेंट पर डे इज मस्ट फॉर अ लॉयर एंड दैट जजमेंट मे नॉट बी रिलेटेड टू वन सब्जेक्ट और अ केस बिकॉज अनलेस एंड अंटिल दैट रीडिंग हैबिट इज देयर we will be caught one day in the court because many a times uh, a lawyer will argue prepare or give advice to his client based upon the insight so a reading only will give us an insight secondly reading not only the judgment we need to read something extra some good books maybe one page two page three pages of some uh, very we have number of interesting books so the second r is in my life is enrichment we need to learn new things we need to imbibe new things the third r is writing that we must write down something pen down something you know some kind of either article or views or something um, even writing with our own you know um, sharing something and last of all is articulation that is again very important that how we articulate we never argue in the court the moment a son argues with a father a student argues with a teacher or a lawyer argues with a judge he is out so we only articulate our point how we summarize how we concisely present our summary so basically a lawyer means synonym to hard work and picking the hard work right from that stage you know where it never comes to an end that is why we remain a student we remain young forever thank you sir uh, yes, you okay, see brother lokesh and uh, amarvik after such a long time thank you sir thank you thank you for joining us and yes sir it is always a pleasure talking to you appearing before you in the court yes it was always a pleasure <laughs> always sir privilege thank you thank you uh, lokesh what will be your uh, as he said uh, our wake the lawyers are always young so what will be your insights to all the young lawyers including all of us that gives a heartening message during the lockdown that we are all young young i do not know whether a lawyer is always or not but yes lawyer is always a student lawyer is always a student of law and i so far as young student as young lawyers are concerned i would only say that whenever a client comes to you on because there is always a particular subject on which the client comes to you with a, with his problem so i learnt it from one very senior advocate he told me beta sabse pehle us law se related jo bhi bear act hai wo kharido wo padho aur uske baad aage to jis bhi whatever the law relating to which a problem has come to you first of all instead of reading the judgments on that first of all read the bear act and then the judgment will come uh, we will before we part we will ask justice kuldeep singh what is his message to the lawyers and the students and all the participants who are watching us and hearing us you know vikas the lawyers are always young at the heart so if you are young at heart you have the courage you have you can work hard and uh, as i said earlier that uh, there is uh, no alternative to the hard work so get the mastery over the facts the pleadings and then comes the law and then success is there you know in most of the cases if if you are good at the facts and the law you have the good chance of succeeding in your appeal whether it is first appeal second appeal or any other litigation so that is my message hard work hard work and have the mastery over the case before you and don't argue any case just going through the judgments of both the courts because it is very tricky the judges do commit a mistake they uh, sometimes give the wrong facts they wrong findings sometimes they don't discuss the documents so first go through the entire lower, lower court file so success uh, is there thank you sir i will just ask uh, when mr amar vivek said four hours i would also ask, uh, like to add for all the persons that they should also revisit the entire pleading sometimes you revisit then you learn something then relook the entire what has been drafted 
and also that one should relook as to even even on the next time of date i was just hearing one of the webinars uh, webinars on the youtube itself they said that even if you have prepared the notes on the next date of hearing don't just simply sit and rely upon the notes but rather you should relook and revisit the entire file because sometimes the point which you had noted on that day may not be the star point of argument for the next day so that's my personal take and thank you for everyone stay safe stay blessed and connect tomorrow again at 4 pm and thank you to the speakers and above all justice kuldeep singh and all the participants who have joined us stay safe stay healthy thank you thank you thank you sir